How's everybody doing today? Good. 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 Oh, I'm all right, thanks. Um, it's nice that we finally have what sort of seems like seasonal weather. It's not too hot, not too cold today. And um, it kind of puts us in the right state of mind, I guess, for the holiday that's coming up this weekend. What do we have coming up on Monday? Memorial, Memorial, Memorial Day. Day. Memorial Day, which many people consider to be the unofficial start of summer. Lots of people are making plans to go to the beach or to have barbecues and cookouts and things like that. But when we think about Memorial Day, the meaning of the day itself, the reason why we have that holiday is, is deeper than just hot dogs and baseball games. Uh, it has to do with the, the sacrifice of members of the military over the long history of the United States. It is a day that is set aside to remember those sacrifices, to remember those who have lost their lives in the numerous military conflicts that our country has been involved in, and those who survived those conflicts, but still sacrificed for this nation. So today's talk, it, we're going to focus on the ways in which we commemorate those who have served, those who have died in these various conflicts. So uh, the name of the talk is From These Honored Dead. We're going to be looking at commemoration and remembrance. Now, um, there are lots of ways that we remember people in our lives who are no longer part of our lives. Certainly one of the, the more uh, powerful ways, and I'll have a couple of images of, of this later on, is um, by visiting a cemetery. Uh, military cemeteries in particular are, are striking, they are powerful, they they embody a lot of emotion, um, the way that they are set up, the way that they are organized. And it is really with the creation of the first national cemetery in the United States that the story of commemoration and remembrance, that the story of the idea of a Memorial Day really begins. Now, what was that first national military cemetery? Arlington. No, it was actually Gettysburg. Oh, okay. Gettysburg. Um, Gettysburg is dedicated as a national cemetery in November of 1863, right in the middle of the Civil War. The Civil War, of course, is one of the, perhaps the defining conflict in American history. It's certainly our bloodiest conflict. We had Americans fighting against Americans in American towns and American fields. Um, and the, the idea to dedicate a national cemetery at Gettysburg emerged shortly after that battle was fought. The battle was fought in the first three days of July of 1863. Mm -hmm. It was the uh, single bloodiest battle in American history. Um, and it was a decisive battle of the Civil War. The Union victory, the defeat of the Confederacy at Gettysburg, essentially turned the tide of the war. It, um, I don't want to say guaranteed that the Union would be victorious, but it certainly helped that cause. So shortly after the battle, it was determined that a cemetery should be established for the, those who fought and died on, on the outskirts of Gettysburg, on those, those fields outside of the town. And the dedication ceremony was set to be held in the middle of November of 1863. Now, this was a big event. It was a, a big deal to dedicate this national cemetery, this final resting place. So lots of important people were invited. There were all sorts of speakers that were, that were um, invited to give, give various addresses at the cemetery, at the dedication ceremony. Now, the keynote speaker the person who was brought in to give the central address, the main, the main address, was a popular orator from Massachusetts, a guy named Edward Everett. Now, how many of you are familiar with Edward Everett and his works? Wow. I guess his popularity didn't, didn't translate so well. In any case, so we have this big event. There are going to be a procession through the city. There were going to be military units accompanying the procession. A very solemn ceremony was planned for the dedication of the, the uh, cemetery at Gettysburg. And as the, um, the days are ticking down, and as we are approaching the end of October and the beginning of November, somebody has the idea that, wait, maybe we should invite the president. <laughs> maybe we should ask Abraham Lincoln to come and give a few appropriate remarks. And that's actually what his invitation letter said. 
a few appropriate remarks. Since this is a national cemetery, since it is dedicated to those who fought here and died here, maybe the commander in chief should be present for this dedication ceremony. So kind of at the last minute, Abraham Lincoln is invited to attend this ceremony to give those few appropriate remarks. Um, so by November of 1863, this idea of commemorating those who had fallen does become very significant, does become an important aspect of commemoration and remembering. Now what we see here on the screen are a couple of um, images from that dedication ceremony. Here we see the assembled crowd, lots of guys on horseback. This is the famous gateway at the Gettysburg Cemetery that was already a cemetery at Gettysburg. They were adding the, uh, the National Cemetery kind of onto that cemetery. And here we see a picture of the, uh, the stage with various dignitaries who are there to give speeches and to applaud and that sort of thing. Um, can anybody find Lincoln here in this image? Black hat. Uh, I'll give you a hint, he's not the guy with the top hat. Oh. <laughs> he's, the side thing? he's right over here. Oh. That's Abraham Lincoln right there in the center of the photograph. Now, let me tell you the story of this photograph. All the, the speeches that were given that day at Gettysburg were kind of long speeches. Mm -hmm. the, the orators, the talkers like to hear themselves talk, so they went mm -hmm. on for hours and hours. Edward Everett gave the keynote address, supposedly spoke for about two hours. Uh, now remember, this was entertainment event in those days. This was a big event, so people loved this sort of stuff. So you have Edward Everett, who goes on hour after hour, giving this, this patriotic and, you know, well-structured speech, laying aside this, this ground as that final resting place. And then, Abraham Lincoln's turn to speak. The president stands up removes his hat, and begins to give his speech. Now, Lincoln's speech was different than all the other ones that day. It was short. Uh, he spoke for a little bit more than two minutes. In fact, his speech was so short that the photographer there didn't actually get a picture of Lincoln giving the speech. He didn't snap his shutter until after Lincoln was done and was already sitting down. So we don't actually have a photograph of Lincoln giving the Gettysburg Address. We have him before, we have him after, right over here. Yet, despite the fact that Lincoln's speech was so short, in fact, he caught the audience by surprise, he said his stuff, sat down, people were wondering what happened. Uh, and eventually people started applauding. It was kind of this slow building applause when people realized that he was actually done with his speech. Well, despite the brevity of that speech, and despite the fact that it was, Lincoln was a, a last-minute addition to, to the program for this dedication ceremony, the speech he gave that day in Gettysburg was perhaps one of the most significant speeches in American history. Famously, it's known as the Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address. Uh, the Gettysburg Address. And though it is very brief, here we see the entire thing, oh uh, it was, and still is, remarkably powerful. And what Lincoln does in this speech is he essentially um, condenses the story of the United States from the time of the Declaration of Independence to the Civil War. And he lays out an idea that the sacrifice made by those soldiers who fought at Gettysburg, who fought in some of the other battles of this conflict, were in fact sacrificing themselves to rededicate the nation. Uh, I'm going to read the Gettysburg Address again. It'll only take me about two minutes. But just listen to the words, because it is tremendously powerful. He begins, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, 
that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. That was the entirety of Lincoln's speech. And he was met by stunned silence, just like that. Um, <laughs> when people realized he had finished, and when they, they absorbed what he had said, there was rapturous applause. Newspaper reporters who were covering this event uh, sent telegrams back to New York, to Philadelphia, to Boston. And Lincoln's words were transmitted across the country. Now, the idea that Lincoln puts forward in this speech, that those who died there shall not have died in vain, becomes hugely significant in the period after the Civil War. But the idea of commemorating those people was one that really grows from Gettysburg and from Lincoln's speech right here. Almost immediately in the aftermath, we see uh, people in all parts of the United States beginning to find ways to remember those who had fought in the war, who had died in the war. Um, widows and orphans would go to place uh, wreaths and flowers on the graves of their fathers and husbands and brothers who, who died during this conflict. And what we begin to see is that kind of a, a sense of national mourning emerges out of the destruction and the loss of life of the Civil War. In the immediate aftermath of the war, it became common for people in communities to gather together to remember those who had died. These gatherings come to be called decoration days, or uh, because people would go out and decorate the graves of the fallen with those flowers, with those wreaths, with those rivets and commemorations. So we begin to see this, this movement emerging out of the Civil War, out of the loss of life, to remember those who had sacrificed themselves. Now, there had been previous um, monuments built in the United States. The idea of building monuments and remembrances is not something that was new with the Civil War. But many of those earlier monuments, monuments to the Mexican War, to the Spanish, or excuse me, to the, the War of 1812, to the Revolution, tended to be um, more celebratory, celebratory about those who fought, about the accomplishments that they had. What we see after the Civil War, and again, the death and destruction that accompanied the Civil War, were monuments that were meant to mourn, but also to keep memories alive. So, the Civil War really transformed American society, transformed how we thought about our past, transformed how we remembered those who had sacrificed for the country. As soon as the war ended, we do begin to see across the nation the building of monuments, the building of memorials to those who had fought and who had died. One of the earliest memorials um, is actually about a block away from where we are right now. Yeah. Memorial Hall. Right. Oh, yeah. uh, I guess it's two blocks away from where we are right now. Um, this was constructed here in Foxborough, completed around 1868. And the purpose of this, this chapel was to commemorate those men from Foxborough who had fought and who had died in the conflict. The interior of this building, and I have to admit I have not yet been into the interior of this building. Uh, every time I go there, the door is locked. Um, maybe they see me coming. Um, in the building itself, there are tablets that have the names of those men from, from Foxborough who did fight in the conflict of the Civil War. So this becomes an early form of memorial for those who fought and died in that conflict. Uh, it's designed to be kind of a, a place of contemplation. It has the, the look of a Gothic-style chapel. It was a popular architectural style in the, uh, the middle of the 19th century. And it was, um, again, meant to keep the memory alive of those who had fought and died. Um, as you probably know, this was also used as the town library for a while. Um, beginning in the 1870s, I believe. Um, so this was one of those early ways in which communities could memorialize and commemorate those who had fought. Uh, up at the top, of course, there is the famous, locally famous statue of the Civil War soldier that was recently restored. When was that restoration completed? Four or five years, Four or five years ago, right? 
Um, that statue was added much after the chapel itself was built. That's a later addition, early 20th century addition to the, the rest of the structure. But we have this memorial to those who fought in the conflict. By the time we get to the 1870s and 1880s, more and more Civil War memorials begin to spring up across the country. Now, for the most part, we're going to be looking at um, New England, just because that's what we're most familiar with. But we do see these memorials being constructed, being paid for in communities across the United States. One of the, um, the grandest of these Civil War memorials, not too far from us, is the one in Cambridge, Massachusetts, on Cambridge Common, um, about two blocks from Harvard Yard. This monument was designed by twin brothers, Cyrus and Darius Cobb. And what we see is that it's kind of a, um, it kind of has the look of a Greco-Roman temple. These pilasters here, the arches, there are stars representing the Union along the top of the arches. You have, again, that Civil War soldier up here at the top. And then here in the center, made out of, a, of different, out of a different material. This is a stone monument here in the center. You have a statue made out of bronze. Does anybody know who that statue is? It's Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln himself was a victim of the Civil War. He was killed at the end of that conflict. He was assassinated, of course, in April of 1865. So this monument not only commemorates those who fought in the conflict, but it also commemorates Abraham Lincoln. So we see this type of monument also becoming fairly common. We have the chapel that was built here. We have this kind of a neoclassical monument celebrating the soldiers and celebrating Abraham Lincoln. Now, one of the more popular Civil War monuments that does um, really begin to spread across the country in the 1880s was a statue called the American Volunteer. Uh, and here we see that statue of the American Volunteer. This was constructed in, uh, or designed in 1880 by a sculptor named Carl Conrads. Uh, he designed the figure of the soldier up here. The pedestal itself was designed by an architect named George Keller. Now remember those two names, Carl Conrads and George Keller, because we're gonna come back to them in a couple of minutes. This statue was placed at the Antietam National Cemetery in Sharpsburg, Maryland. Uh, the Battle of Antietam, which was fought in September of 1862 was one of the great battles of the Civil War. It was the single bloodiest day in American history. Uh, the two armies, the Confederate Army, the Union Army, meet outside of Sharpsburg. The battle is um, tremendously destructive. And in the aftermath of that war, a national cemetery was established on the Antietam battlefield. And this was one of the monuments that was constructed there, celebrating those men who volunteered to fight for the Union. Now, the reason why this is such a significant monument is because the statue becomes tremendously popular. Mm -hmm. And we begin to see copies of that statue being mass produced and uh, distributed and sold across the United States. In fact, here we see three copies of that American volunteer. Uh, this one over here is in Mystic, Connecticut. This here is in Easton, Massachusetts. And this here is in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. It's the same statue. The pedestals are different, the bases are different, but that statue of the volunteer is repeated over and over and over again. Now, how does that happen? Well, Carl Conrad's the, the, the sculptor of the American volunteer, um, happened to work for a manufacturing company in Hartford, Connecticut, the New England Granite Works. And one of the things that the Granite Works specialized in was building large public monuments. Here you had a powerful image, a popular image, to commemorate the Civil War. They essentially started mass producing that image and distributing it. In fact, in the aftermath of the Civil War, what you see are catalogs being produced where you could go and order a statue to be put on your town green to commemorate the, the conflict of the Civil War. It wasn't only the American volunteer, there were many other models that were also produced, mass produced in different foundries and different, different um, industries across the United States. Now this image of the New England Granite Works is um, particularly appropriate when talking about the American volunteer, because what do we see in the image? 
right here laying on the ground, it's the American volunteer. And right here on the left hand side, it's that same statue. These are being produced in these granite works. Uh, you can see the variety of other statues they produced there also. So the period after the Civil War was a period of industrial growth in the United States. And we do begin to see the mass production of lots of different things, memorials being one of those objects that were mass produced. So you could go to Mystic, you could go to Easton, you could go to Ohio and find that same statue that was commemorating the same group of men who fought, who died, who struggled during the Civil War. Now, since we're talking about Hartford, um, and just full disclosure, I did grow up just outside of Hartford, so you have a kind of affinity for the city. Uh, one of the more remarkable and um, unique Civil War memorials was constructed in downtown Hartford. And that is the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch. Now, have any of you been to Hartford? I am. Really, that's it? Three of you? It's <laughs> uh, not that far to get to. Um, during its heyday, in the late 19th and early 20th century, Hartford was one of the um, leading cities in the United States. It was a center of industry. Mark Twain lived there for much of his professional career. So it really was a beautiful city. It was a, a, uh, a wealthy city. And what we see is that the inhabitants of Hartford were very proud of their contributions to the national struggle, were very proud of their, the sacrifices that were made by the men of Hartford in the Civil War. So this monument, was conceived and constructed in Hartford. It was a, a memorial arch, a victory arch, if you will, that was spanning the Park River. Now, the Park River no longer exists in Hartford. It has all been channelized underground. Uh, this used to flood all the time and caused all sorts of destructions. In the 1930s, they essentially encased it in concrete. Uh, it still flows, but it's underneath the city now. Well, this memorial arch is significant because it is the first permanent victory arch in the United States. There had been victory arches and, and memorial arches constructed at different times in American history, but those were all temporary structures. This one here is the first permanent one. And the person who designed this was the architect, George Keller, the man who had designed the base of the volunteer statue at Antietam. So we see that connection. Uh, of course, George, George Keller was a Hartford architect. He knew the guys that worked at the New England Granite Works in Hartford, so there was this collaboration that went on. Now, what's remarkable and what's really kind of cool about this statue, uh, excuse me, about this, this arch, is that around the base of it, around each of the towers, there are three figures that represented the various occupations that the men of Hartford um, gave up to go and fight in the struggle. So you have the student, the manufacturer, the, uh, the fisherman, there's a statue of a freed slave who let go of his chains or broke free of his chains and went, went to fight in the struggle for freedom and for the abolition of slavery. And then here along the top of the monument, you have these terracotta friezes that depict two scenes of the story of the Civil War. The one on the south side depicts a scene of war where you have mounted generals commanding the troops into battle and men dying there in this in this stylized depiction of war. The one on the south side showed the soldiers coming home. Excuse me, on the north side showed the soldiers coming home. They're being greeted by the city of Hartford, here represented by this female figure, and by their wives, by their children, by their families. It's a scene of celebration. So on one side, you have this scene of death and destruction and war. Here, you have the scenes of homecoming and welcome and um, renewal in many ways. So that Hartford, the arch in Hartford is really a remarkable, remarkable structure in terms of what it represented in terms of the history of the structure itself. Now a little bit closer to home, we do see other significant Civil War memorials that are constructed. Um, one of the most famous, of course, is this one, the Robert Gould Shaw Memorial. How many of you have seen this? A few more. Uh, this, of course, is located on Beacon Hill, right across from the, uh, the stairs of the State House. You know the story of Robert Gould Shaw? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he was a, uh, from a wealthy, prominent Boston family, a member of the Boston Brahmin. Uh, and in 1863, the federal government authorized the, the, the um, creation of African-American military units. So what we see is that African-American men could now 
enlist to fight in the cause for the eradication of slavery. And one of the first units that was formed was the Massachusetts 54th. Uh, Shaw was um, made an officer of the 54th. He was the colonel of the 54th. And he would lead that unit into battle um, in the South. Now, famously, uh, the 54th was given the, um, the task of leading the attack on Fort Wagner in South Carolina. Now, those of you who have seen the movie Glory, starring Matthew Broderick and Morgan Freeman and others, uh, that is a, a dramatic retelling of the story of the 54th. But in that attack on Fort Wagner, um, Shaw, leading his men into the fort, was killed, uh, as were many of his men. And his body was dumped in a ditch on the battlefield, and they were all buried together. Now, the Confederates buried him with his men because they thought that was insulting, because he was white and they were not. Uh, to Shaw's family, however, that was seen as a great mark of honor that he was with his men, the men who he had led, the men who had, who had allowed him to achieve this glory. Well, almost immediately after the, his death on the battlefield, Shaw's family and many prominent Bostonians had the idea of building a memorial for him and for the 54th. Now, the original plan was that the monument would be built at the site where they were buried in South Carolina. But that proved too controversial for the people of South Carolina. So that idea was abandoned, and it actually kind of um, laid dormant for a few years. It isn't until the 1880s that the idea of building a monument for Shaw and the 54th was, was reignited by wealthy Bostonians, particularly the African American community in Boston. And what we see is that plans were, were developed to place this memorial there on Beacon Hill. That was, after all, Shaw's neighborhood. So um, a, an artist is hired and commissioned to create this monument. The artist's name was Augustus Sengelden, uh, one of the prominent American sculptors at the end of the 19th century. Uh, this would end up being one of his more famous works. Gaudin received the Saint-Gaudin received the commission for this statue in um, 1883 or 84. He would spend the next 13 or 14 years working out how he wanted the monument to look. It took him a tremendously long time. In fact, he spent more time working on this sculpture than on any of his other works. Now, part of the reason for that is because he wanted to, to make it look realistic. So he had models come and pose in contemporary uniforms. So each of the men on this monument is unique. They are based on actual models that posed for the artist. He wanted accuracy in the representation of the horse. So the creation of this monument did take a very, very long time. But eventually, in 1897, the, the final product, the bronze monument in the stone, uh, the stone frame was dedicated was unveiled there on Boston Common across from the, uh, the State House. And it does become, or it is, one of the more uh, powerful images of the Civil War. Because it's not, though it's called the Shaw Memorial, it's not just celebrating the one man. It is celebrating the officer here, but also the men who he led in battle, the men who he fought beside, the men who he died with. So it really is an all-encompassing memorial, certainly to Shaw, but also to the Massachusetts 54th. Um, and it is one of the great, the great pieces of public art in the city of Boston. Now, of course, the Civil War, because of its destructiveness, because of the loss of life, did spawn a cottage industry in the production of monuments. We saw the American Volunteer. Um, there are replicas of this monument that are smaller in scale that were constructed in different places. Another popular image of the, uh, the Civil War, another popular statue that was meant to commemorate the Civil War, was this statue. This is called the Volunteer. Uh, the one we see here is in North Attleboro. It was uh, mm. constructed in North Attleboro mm. in 1911. However, the first version of this statue was sculpted by uh, Theo Alice Ruggles Kitson in 1902 for the Civil War Memorial in Newburyport. So, like we saw with the American Volunteer, this one was created for a specific location, but proved to be tremendously popular. And soon, copies of this were constructed and created. There is a copy that was built in 1911 in um, Providence that sparked a, a boom 
in the construction of this monument. In fact, the, uh, the Gorham Manufacturing Company in Providence bought the rights to the statue and began to manufacture it and distribute it all over. There are copies scattered throughout Massachusetts in places like Sharon and Topsfield and Andover. And in fact, uh, it is this figure that would become the central figure on the Massachusetts State Monument at uh, Vicksburg in Mississippi. Uh, at the Vicksburg battlefield, states contributed to build memorials to their men who fought there. This becomes the central figure of the Massachusetts Memorial down in Vicksburg. Now, uh, Theo Alice Ruggles Kitson is actually a pretty important person when it comes to the building of these memorials and the, cons the designing of these memorials in the beginning of the, 19th, uh, excuse me, the 20th century. She was a local artist born in, in um, Brookline and spent much of her professional career work, working in Boston, Quincy, uh, Framingham, creating lots of these public monuments, these, these celebrations of those who fought in the various conflicts across the United States. Another of her significant statues is this one called The Hiker. Now, the original The Hiker, which is the one we see here, was um, placed on the University of Minnesota campus in Minneapolis in 1906, and it was a statue that was meant to commemorate those American troops who had fought in the Spanish-American War, 1898, in the Philippine-American War, which lasted from uh, 1899 to 1903, and in the Boxer Rebellion of 1901. So it was meant to, to commemorate those troops who fought in those end-of-the-century conflicts for the United States. Now, like the volunteer, this statue did become tremendously popular. In fact, it was um, Kitson's most popular statue. It was the thing that she becomes pretty well known for. And what we see is that within a decade or two, numerous copies of the hiker are being manufactured, again, mass produced through the Gorham Company in Providence, and distributed across the United States. It's estimated there are about 50 copies of the hiker spread from New England out to Texas and beyond, uh, commemorating those who fought, again, in those end-of-the-century conflicts for the United States. Um, we can see here, it says Cuba, China, and the Philippines, the three uh, geographic locations where much of the fighting took place during those conflicts. In general, these <laughs> statues show a determined soldier carrying his, his uh, rifle in his hand, um, that he's often standing on this type of a, a pedestal, which has the cross that represented the Spanish-American War and the conflict of the Spanish-American War itself. Um, so again, we see a figure of a soldier as a way to memorialize the soldiers who fought in that conflict. Now, um, again, I'm going to show my Hartford bias here, but there is also a fantastic Spanish-American War Memorial in Hartford, not too far from that memorial arch we just looked at. And it is this construction that is called the Spirit of Victory. Um, the Spirit of Victory was designed by Evelyn Beatrice Longman, and it is a representation of the classical goddess Victory. Um, some of you might be familiar with the ancient Greek statue, the Nike, that's in the Louvre Museum. Uh, the winged goddess of victory. This is loosely modeled on that. What we have here is the goddess of victory. You can see her wings unfurled behind her. She's holding in her hand the shield that is covered with the American flag, the stars and the stripes, kind of a, uh, an early version of Captain America's shield, if you want to look at it like that. And in her right hand, what is she holding up? A torch. A torch. Now, where else do we know of a statue of a woman who's holding a torch in her right hand? Lady Liberty. Lady Liberty. So perhaps there is an influence of that here in this uh, spirit of victory. In any case, the goddess is standing on what looks like the prow of a ship. After all, it was American naval power that was decisive in the Spanish-American War. And on either side of that ship prow, you have depictions of the American fighting man, the, the sailor over here and the soldier over here who contributed to the victory in the Spanish-American War. So. Um, whereas many of the earlier monuments we looked at depicted a soldier in action, either marching or, or standing or uh, carrying his firearms, this is almost a, um, a mythological scene with a goddess bringing victory to the United States. Now, it is built, constructed in 1926, um, 
That's some 40 years after, some 30 years after the Spanish-American War. So it was kind of a late monument to that conflict. Um, what happens between the Spanish-American War and the construction of this monument? Does the United States get involved in any other fights? World War I. World War I, of course. Uh, in 1917, the United States is drawn into the First World War. Uh, hundreds of thousands of American troops are sent over to Europe to fight in the fields of Flanders and in Fran uh, eastern France to fight against the Germans. Uh, American presence in World War I certainly was uh, important in turning the tide of the war and leading to the eventual defeat of Germany and Austria and their allies. Um, it was a war that was tremendously costly for the United States. More than 200,000 Americans were casualties of that conflict. Uh, much like what we see in the Civil War, the loss of life in the First World War caused deep scars in American society. And as we saw in the aftermath of the Civil War, in the aftermath of the First World War, there was a desire to publicly remember those who had fought, to publicly remember those who had died. And what we see during, in the 1920s, going into the 1930s, is a, a boom in monument building. Uh, a new conflict did spark a new interest in building new types of public monuments. One of the more uh, unique <coughs> of these uh, World War I monuments is located in Milton, Massachusetts. It's a statue called In Flanders Field. Uh, that line, of course, comes from a famous poem about World War I. In Flanders Field, the poppies grow. Uh, the poppies themselves do become symbols of the, the veterans of the First World War. Um, now, this statue, which if you're familiar with Milton at all, is located right outside the city hall, the town hall, uh, basically across the street from their public library, was designed by Daniel Chester French. Is that a name that any of you recognize? Yeah. Yeah. What is he famous for? I want to say the Lincoln Memorial. Hmm? I was going to say the State House, but no, the top, the top. Ah, uh, he may have, but it's actually the Lincoln Memorial that he's probably best known for. He's the man who sculpts the image of Abraham Lincoln seated in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, wow. D.C. Yeah, is his studio down in, uh, what do I want to say, near, uh, where's this, there's a studio, is that? I, I don't know. <laughs> Talk to where, me afterwards. Where they, where they play in summer, where they play in summer in, uh, where well, the BSL plays in summer. Well, you might have a studio out yeah, there, actually. I I, I that does sound about right. Yeah. Um, in any case, French, who was at this time one of the more prominent, one of the more well-known names among American sculptors and artists, uh, is commissioned to design a monument to commemorate the, the victims of the First World War for Milton. And this is what he comes up with. Now, this is unlike other statues we've seen. What we have here is a... Uh, a young, athletic-looking man uh, with a uh, strategically placed cloth kind of draped across it. And in his right hand, he's again holding a torch. But unlike in the Statue of Liberty, and unlike in that victory statue we just saw in Hartford, this torch is being passed to a new generation. So he's passing the torch from the, the generation that led the nation and led the world to the destruction of World War I into a generation that is now going to try to rebuild the world after the destruction of the First World War. It really is a striking statue because it is so unique. You don't really see copies of this anywhere else. It is pretty much a one-off statue. Um, there we see the front view, and here we see a close-up of that, that uh, male figure that French created. Now, one of the iconic figures that emerges out of the First World War that comes to be a stand-in for those who fought in the war was the Doughboy. Now, what is a Doughboy? That was the nickname given to American troops, American soldiers who were sent off to fight in Europe. Uh, why they were given the nickname the Doughboy is kind of debated. There are all sorts of different stories. Uh, part of it might have to do from kind of the Spanish-American War, where American soldiers had a lot of flour, so they were constantly mi mixing up dough to make food. Uh, some, one story claims that because of all the gear they had to carry with them, it made them look puffy as they were marching into battle, so they kind of looked like doughboys. Uh, we don't really know where that term comes from, but it does become a name that is synonymous with American soldiers in the First World War. And the, the image of the doughboy 
does become an iconic image in memorials to the First World War. One common, uh, common image of the doughboy is this one here, which was created by our friend Theo Alice Riggles, uh, excuse me, Ruggles Kitson. Um, she was well regarded for building, for designing these memorials, these public statues, Civil War ones, Spanish American War ones. She uh, was commissioned to create images uh, and memorials for those who fought in the First World War. This was her creation. This was her celebration of the doughboy. Now this one here is in Mansfield, Massachusetts, right down the road. Uh, that's where I live. I actually walked across the street to take this picture. <laughs> but it is not the only one around. There's one similar to this in Providence. There's one like this in Hopkinton, right at the start of the Boston Marathon. Uh, if you go to downtown Hopkinton and they have a big line painted on the ground, right there in that, tra that uh, traffic triangle, you have another version of uh, Kitson's statue. Now this was constructed in Mansfield in 1937. Uh, Kitson had died in 1932. But the license for the statue was um, with the Gorham Manufacturing Company in Providence, Rhode Island. So even after the artist's death, they continued to sell versions of her work to commemorate those who fought in the First World War. Now, as I mentioned, the idea and the image of the doughboy does become synonymous with the First World War, does become a common way of celebrating those who fought in the war. And what we see is that it is an image that is used in various memorials. Now here, um, we have two different Doughboy statues. These are two separate statues created by two separate artists. The one over there on the left is called the Spirit of the American Doughboy by an American artist named E.M. Vikesny. Uh, that one is actually in Helena, Arkansas. It was placed there in 1927. This one over here is called Over the Top to Victory by American artist John Paulding. Uh, this statue is in Bolton Landing, New York. It was unveiled in 1921. Now these two artists, working independently, came up with essentially the, um, the same representation of the doughboy. Both statues are very similar in pose. They have their right hand clenched and up. Uh, they're both carrying their weapon in their left hand. They are both striding forward. You'll notice one of the differences is the angle of the rifle. Here it's pointing up, there it's pointing down. But basically, the images are very, very <laughs> similar. Now, what did this lead to? Well, it led to a lawsuit, because why not, right? Uh, the artists began to, to, well, they were openly competing for commissions. These statues were going to be mass produced. They were going to be distributed across the United States. And they became fierce rivals. In fact, they would often print newspaper ads side by side. One saying, this is the original, buy this one. The other one saying, this one's better, don't buy that one. Uh, so you see these competing, and they do end up suing each other over a copyright infringement. Uh, now, the outcome of that law case I haven't been able to find, so maybe it's still in a court somewhere in New York <laughs> trying to decide who actually owns the copyright to this. But we do see these two competing images, these two competing doughboys that uh, do become popular images across the United States. Now, Pekesny's over here does become the more popular of the two. He sells about 135 or so of those. So again, they are in communities all across the United States. Um, now, there is one more Doughboy Memorial I do want to show you. And it's a relatively unique one. This one here in East Providence, Rhode Island. This was designed by a local artist named Pietro Montana, or Montana, if you want to anglicize it. And what's unique about this is that the doughboy there um, isn't really celebrated. He doesn't look relaxed. He doesn't look victorious. He looks tired, like he has been fighting. He looks, uh, his pants are torn from the efforts he has go gone through. Uh, what's even more remarkable about, remarkable about this is that this statue was modeled after somebody who was, um, would become a celebrity in the 20th century. How many of you have heard of Charles Atlas? What's he known for? Everybody does this. The bodybuilder. Uh, this is Charles Atlas. He, he was one of Montana's favorite models. Uh, he was actually from Providence. So he was uh, one of the, the, the models that the artists turned to frequently. And this is the memorial for World War I 
veterans for the Doughboys that is there in East Providence, Rhode Island. Now, um, while all of this monument building was going on in the United States and all of this commemoration for those who fought in the First World War was happening here, the same thing was happening in Europe. There were monuments built in France to commemorate those who died on the battlefields of France. There are monuments that are built in England and in Germany and in Italy and in Turkey to commemorate those who fought in and died in this conflict. Um, so this type of memorialization wasn't, certainly isn't unique to the United States. Yet, in this period after the First World War, as we thought we could never allow this to happen again, what begins to happen? Well, the road to the Second World War emerges. In 1939, the Second World War does break out in Europe. The United States tries to stay out of the conflict. We managed to do so for about two years, but then in December of 1941, um, the United States is attacked by the Japanese, we end up declaring war against Japan, we end up declaring war against Italy and Germany, and by early 1942, the United States was committed to that conflict. Now, in fighting the Second World War, American servicemen were sent around the world. Unlike the First World War, where most of the fighting took place in Europe, the Second World War was a truly global war. There was fighting in Africa, there was fighting in the Pacific, there was fighting in Europe and American troops went to all of those places. And uh, hundreds of thousands of American troops were killed in the struggle to liberate Europe, to defeat, uh, to defeat Imperial Japan. Perhaps some of the more powerful monuments to those who fell in the Second World War are actually the cemeteries on those foreign battlefields um, in the islands of the Pacific, in Europe. This one is the, the American cemetery at Colville-sur-Mer, which is uh, right above Omaha Beach, uh, where the D-Day landings took place. Um, it is a solemnly beautiful place. If you've never been there, it is um, one of the more emotional places I've ever been to. Uh, it is a pristine, beautiful green lawn, looking out over the English Channel, and rows and rows and rows of white crosses and white stars of David, marking the burial places of those men who fought for the liberation of Europe in 1944, in the immediate, during the D-Day invasions and in the immediate aftermath. It is, um, as I said, one of the more powerful places. And you'll notice that each one of these graves has an American flag and a French flag located next to it. It's because the people of France, um, hold this as sacred ground. They have not forgotten the sacrifices that were made to liberate France during the Second World War. So you have places like this which are, are evocative, which are powerful reminders of the sacrifices that were made for, uh, from those men who were fighting overseas. Yet it isn't only these places that are memorials to the fallen, because Again, here at home, there was a desire to remember those who had fought, those who had died in the struggles. And what we see in the late 1940s, 1950s, actually coming up into the early 21st century, are World War II memorials that are constructed across the United States. Now, one of the uh, ones local to us is the World War II memorial in Boston. This is in the Back Bay Fens. Uh, and it was designed by a local artist, John Paramino, in 1949. And what we see in this World War II memorial is up here in front, the goddess of victory. Again, Nike, the, the classical Greek mm -hmm. goddess of victory. And behind her, on this curved wall, are uh, tablets inscribed with the names of the Boston men who fought and died in the conflict. Uh, I believe there are 28 of those tablets that make up that background behind the goddess of victory. Now, as I said, these memorials were built for decades after the conclusion of the Second World War. Um, down in Washington, D.C., the, the World War II memorial was only constructed and completed recently, within the last 10 years or so. Um, down in Providence, the World War II memorial was built in 2007. Now, the Providence memorial, and many of the modern memorials that were built, tended to have a, a stark simplicity to them. Now, if we look at this memorial, there's no statues there. It is basically an architectural feature 
uh, classical columns surrounded by this ring that says World War II Memorial. Uh, around the outside of this, there are concrete benches that do have names inscribed onto them, the men of Providence who, uh, the people of Providence who participated and fought in the Second World War. But it is a, a very different sort of memorial from the ones we see earlier in the 21st century with the statues and the heroic images of the, of the soldiers or the goddesses leading, uh, leading the country to victory. Um, so again, a different type of World War II memorial that starts to become much more common uh, the later that they are built. Now here in Foxborough, where's the World War II Memorial? It's on the common. What does it look like? Stone, Stone. lists of names. Uh, that becomes a very, uh, a very common way that uh, communities across the United States remembered those who fought and those who died in these conflicts. Um, having concrete or stone inscribed with names, having brass tablets placed on those monuments, was a way of keeping the memory of those men alive. Um, of course, World War II was the most destructive war in human history, but um, we tend to not learn lessons from history. And within five years to the end of the Second World War, another conflict breaks out in Korea, the Korean War. Korean War is often considered the forgotten war uh, because it kind of, is a smaller military conflict wedged between two larger conflicts, between World War I and the Vietnam War. Um, the Korean War often gets overlooked in the popular imagination. Not so much now, but it used to be in the latter part of the 20th century. Yet we do see, by the 1990s, efforts to commemorate those men who fought and died in the Korean War. Uh, here in Massachusetts, that commemoration takes place in the Korean War Veterans Memorial, which is located at the Charlestown Naval Yard in Charlestown, Massachusetts. Uh, the memorial itself features a GI, an American soldier here in the center, dressed in winter gear. Uh, the Korean War was a, a war that was fought in um, adverse weather conditions, uh, surrounded by kind of a, a, an incomplete hexagon uh, with the names of those who fought and died inscribed again on the brass tablets. Uh, attached to this, um, this structure. Now the National Korean War Memorial, uh, which was installed in Washington, D.C., was created roughly around the same time, in the mid-1990s. That's when we, uh, we as a nation started to, um, to try to remember those men who had fought in the Korean War. Again, it was no longer going to be the Forgotten War. And the National Korean War Memorial, I don't have a, a picture of it, but really is a remarkable uh, remarkable series of sculptures. For those of you who have seen it, it is down on the mall in Washington, D.C., kind of off to one side. Uh, the World War II Memorial, of course, takes up a lot of space in the middle. It's off to one side of that. And what it depicts is a series of American soldiers uh, dressed in their winter gear, um, and it looks like they are marching through a rice paddy of some sort. Uh, there are shrubbery at the, at the ground. It's illuminated at night. So it really is a stark image of men in combat, men uh, depicting the fear and the uncertainty of combat, but also celebrating their resiliency. Um, well, the next major conflict that the United States gets involved in was, of course, the Vietnam conflict. American involvement in Vietnam begins in the late 1950s, and by the time we get to the mid-1960s, there are uh, tens of thousands of American troops on the ground. By 1968, there are half a million American troops in Vietnam. The Vietnam War would become a tremendously controversial struggle, a tremendously controversial war, dividing the American public. Uh, early on, there was broad public support for the Vietnam War, but as it seemed to become a never-ending conflict, and as more and more young men were drafted and sent to fight in Southeast Asia, and as more and more <coughs> flag-draped coffins were coming home, the American public does begin to turn against the conflict. And it really does divide the country. When the Vietnam, when the American effort in Vietnam comes to an end in 1975, there was uncertainty about what to do about the war. How do we remember it? How do we, do we celebrate those who fought there or commemorate those who fought there? Because the war was so controversial, there had to be a period of cooling off, I guess we could say, before plans could be put to place to construct or to think about a Vietnam Veterans Memorial. 
Well, by the early 1980s, um, movements had developed to memorialize and commemorate those men who had fought and died in Vietnam. And a contest was held um, by the National Park Service and the Department of Defense to design a memorial, a fitting memorial for the Vietnam War. The winner of that contest was a 19-year-old uh, architecture student named Maya Lin. And her design was radically different than other memorials that had been constructed. Uh, and her design was controversial in many ways, kind of reflecting the controversy wow. of the war itself. What Maya Lin created and what she designed was a wall of polished black granite that would be um, kind of like a scar in the earth on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And inscribed on each of those granite panels was the name of somebody who had lost their life, their life in the Vietnam conflict. Um, there was, of course, public outrage about the design of the monument. It wasn't heroic. It wasn't celebratory. It was stark. It was serious. It was emotional. Um, kind of fitting for a war as complex as the, the war in Vietnam. Um, once the monument was completed, however, in 1982, it did become one of the, one of the more somber attractions on the, the National Mall. Mm -hmm. It is a place that people for many generations go to reflect on the nature of war, to mourn those who, who lost their lives in Vietnam. You have to remember, this was dedicated only seven years after the last American troops left that country. There were and still are many veterans of the Vietnam War who make pilgrimages to this monument, who see the names of their fallen comrades, their friends that they have lost because of that conflict. And it does, it, it is a, a tremendously moving and tremendously powerful uh, space because of its difference to other war memorials, but also because of what it symbolizes. This is history that, is, that we can all touch, essentially, that is, that is with us. We, know, we all know people who were impacted by, by the Vietnam War. So we see a new form of memorial that develops as a result of the Vietnam War. Now, by the time we get to the late 20th century and into the 21st century, as American wars have taken on new dimensions, uh, new monuments have been constructed. I don't have any uh, pictures of monuments that uh, commemorated the first Gulf War or the second Gulf War or the, the uh, military ventures in Afghanistan. But there are memorials that are located throughout the United States on town greens and mm -hmm. commons and in public parks that commemorate those who died in those conflicts, those who sacrificed in those conflicts. Yet, despite all of this, Despite the variety of monuments that have been created, despite the, the different ways in which people have been remembered, troops have been remembered, veterans have been remembered, uh, perhaps the, the starkest and simplest is an image like this from Arlington National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, perhaps nothing really brings home the magnitude of sacrifice than an image like this with the rows and rows and rows of white headstones uh, covering the field along the Virginia countryside outside of Washington, D.C. So um, as we go into the, the long holiday weekend, uh, and as you prepare to get your pool up and running and fire up the grill, uh, do take a moment to consider what the meaning of the Memorial Day holiday is and think about images like this. Um, because it really does give the day a much deeper, much more solemn and serious meaning. And that, um, that is all I have to say. So if anybody has questions, please feel free to ask. In Gettysburg, were both sides buried there, or was it just the Union? It was originally set up so that just the Union would be buried there. Um, you have to remember the Confederacy, uh, the yeah, Confederates were, con were considered traitors. Um, and there was no room for them at the National Cemetery um, for Union troops. Now, there are Confederates buried there, obviously, because Confederates did die in that battlefield, and their bodies were put to a mass grave. But the formal National Cemetery was for the Union troops. <laughs>
Any other questions? Not a question, but every year on Facebook, I, I copy and paste Dean Flanders Fields' poem. Mm -hmm. It is a, um, I, think, I believe it was written by a Canadian soldier. Uh, McRae. McRae, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a, really, World War I produced some, some uh, powerful literature. There were many poets, uh, Siegfried Sassoon and, and others, who were on the front lines, who were in the trenches and, you know, wrote poems to encapsulate their experiences of what they what they saw in battle, the destruction, the loss of life, the fear, the moments of celebration. So if you ever want to try to get a, an understanding of the First World War um, and the experiences of the men in the, tr in the trenches, the frontline troops, um, reading the poetry that was written by many of those men is tremendously powerful. Uh, McCray does write that famous In Flanders Field poem. Yes? Is there an artist associated with the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? That's a good question. Okay, uh, I'll Google it. Yeah, <laughs> you have to look that up. Now, the idea of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier does emerge as a result of the, uh, the First World War. And it was actually, I believe, the French who first come up with the idea of having a Tomb of an Unknown Soldier. Uh, the French, French losses in the First World War were staggering. Um, something like a million and a half to two million men. Uh, between the ages of you know 18 and 30 were, were lost and many of those that were lost were never recovered or their bodies were never identified uh, in fact some of the war memorials in France are just ossuaries their their buildings where bones are kept because these soldiers were never identified and it's the French who come up with the idea of taking one of those unidentified bodies and burying it with full military honors mm -hmm. as a reminder of the sacrifice of that conflict. So the French do create a tomb of an unknown, the unknown soldier under the Arc de Triomphe in Paris uh, that is capped by an eternal flame. Uh, other countries soon adopt that same practice. And in the United States, we do establish that tomb of the unknown soldier in the middle of the 1920s um, in Arlington National Cemetery. And um, how that was done was that basically a three or four unidentified American bodies were brought back from Europe, and one of those was picked to be placed in that tomb, and that becomes the, the ceremonial tomb of the unknown soldier. Is that when um, the tags were for the, the um, soldiers? Dog tags? Yeah, the dog tags. The or... practice of dog tags, that sort of, sort of military uh, identification, had been around since the Civil War, but I don't know how <laughs> consistent it was actually used. Uh, the dog tags looked different in the early part of the of the days, but um, you know, part of the problem with the, the First World War is that you had industrialized, mechanized warfare, and many of the bodies that many of the people who who were killed, there there was nothing to recover. There were no remains, and those that did have remains often did not have the identification with them. Um, we have you know, unknown soldiers in the Second World War and the Korean conflict and the Vietnam War when dog tags were very much part of the, uh, the equipment that was, that was issued. So um, that identifying characteristic can still be lost. Yes? On the island of Oahu, mm -hmm. there's a similar cemetery. And of course, there at Pearl Harbor, there's the, uh, the Arizona Memorial. Right. Yeah, we were there. Which was, you know, the, the was, when we were there, it was still leaking oil. It still, still is, I think, yeah, to this day. Um, Every so the, often. Yeah, the the USS Arizona, which was sunk during the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, still sits at the bottom of Pearl Harbor, and those men who died in that sinking are still there, entombed on their ship. Uh, there's a memorial built above it, a stark white memorial that has the names of those who were on board the, the Arizona, those who died during the attack on Pearl Harbor. And if you were a, a survivor of Pearl Harbor, you are allowed to have your ashes scattered there over the, the remains of the Arizona. Um, of course, there are fewer and fewer of those men still around, but it is an honor that was that is reserved for those who survived the attack yeah, on Pearl Harbor. We, we know someone who was in the sixth wave of Normandy. I, I cannot imagine um, the bravery it took to to storm off one of those landing crafts, uh, first wave or sixth wave or whenever, um, the the terror that 
many of those men must have felt. Uh, and, and it does make you kind of humble when you think about that, when you go to, you go to, you go to Normandy and you see the cemeteries there. It really is a sobering and um, shocking place to be. Pardon me? Yes? Is Boston the only city that plants the flag lots of, memorial? Lots of cities do that as a way of commemorating. Um, that, that has become relatively popular, planting the little American flags on the common or you know outside the city hall or something like that. Um, in Mansfield, they have the, the Field of Honor, where people sponsor American flags, and those are planted right on the town common. Um, they've been doing that for a few years now. So that does become a way of, of remembering those who lost their lives. Uh, one of the, um, the other dates of remembrance that we have is, of course, Veterans Day in November. Mm -hmm. And on, on Veterans Day, it is, uh, particularly in places like Britain, the poppy that becomes the symbol of remembrance. Because Veterans Day in Europe and much of Europe is Armistice Day, the day of the end of the First World War. It was Armistice Day here until the end of the Second World War. Um, is the, marks the end of that first great global conflict. And like I said, this, the poppy does become the symbol of that conflict. Now, a few years ago, when we had the centennial of the end of the First World War, uh, in London, at the Tower of London, they filled the moat around the tower with thousands and thousands of poppies. That ceramic. Were, ceramic, yes, sculpted poppies that represented all of the, the uh, British Empire troops who had died in that conflict. And it really was a, uh, a striking, remarkable image. You can look that up. On, on Google, and it really is, um, it, it does put things into perspective when you see those fields of red. So mm -hmm. there are other ways of commemorating those who lost their lives. The planting of American flags is certainly one of those here in this country. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks a lot.